ready for takeoff. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Hoffer, and today I'm going to talk about creative problem solving using the Crystal programming language. A little bit about my background. I work full-time with Rails for a company called The Real Real. I typically focus on performance and architecture. I do have some prior experience with Crystal, including connecting it with Ruby and also converting Ruby code to Crystal. If you have ever researched using Crystal to write native extensions in Ruby, you've actually probably seen one of my older projects. And the main thing is I just like to experiment with big problems and see if we can find solutions to them. Now let me talk about the real real for a moment. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, who has ever heard of it as a consumer separate from being in the tech world before? Few hands, okay. That's, I was hoping for at least a couple. <laughs> we do have commercials. It depends on what television you watch. You may see a lot or you may see none of them. Uh, so we are an e-commerce platform. We do luxury consignment. So we sell designer bags, designer watches, clothing, and many more categories. Uh, most of our products come from other consumers who are reselling their items while a small amount comes from retailers and designers directly. Our architecture consists of a Rails monolith and numerous Phoenix front-end apps, which consume data from that Rails app. Uh, we are slowly working to extract services from the Rails app, which kind of gives us the freedom to look at other technologies when we need a creative solution to something. Uh, so now I'm gonna give just a quick introduction to Crystal. Um, I, I think that there was a talk at RubyConf Mini about Crystal, and I'm really excited to see that when the videos come out. Um, but for Crystal, this quote is straight from their website, a language for humans and computers. I think that's actually a really cool way of thinking about it. Um, for humans, we get Ruby's efficiency for writing code, because Crystal has a Ruby-like syntax. And for computers, we get C's efficiency for running the code because Crystal is compiled with LLVM. But rather than talking about it, let's take a look at some Crystal code. If we look at this, it probably looks very familiar. It looks just like Ruby. It starts off with a range from one to nine that we iterate through. We check to see if the number is even, and if it is, we print that, or we print that it's odd. After that, we run a block three times. We take a random number up to 20. We divide it by four and see if the remainder is zero. If so, we print that out. Otherwise, we check to see if it's a single digit number or not. And then we can see the output of this right here. We see the numbers one through nine, and then we see the three random numbers. But guess what? We can run this exact same code as Ruby code and it will give us the exact same output. Now there's one thing I do want to be clear on. Crystal isn't intended to be perfectly compatible with Ruby. And in a bigger program, you can't just copy and paste Ruby code and have it work perfectly. But the language is very similar, and it forms a very powerful foundation for us. Further, let's talk about the Crystal ecosystem as a whole for a moment. The first thing to think about are called shards. Shards are the crystal equivalent of Ruby gems. However, the tooling for shards also includes functionality similar to Bundler. So it's really kind of Ruby gems plus Bundler together. There is an awesome crystal list that contains a wide variety of shards that are available, and it's pretty fun to go through. There are shards for web frameworks, similar to Rails and Sinatra. There are database tools similar to Active Record, and also similar to Ecto for the Elixir fans in here. There is a full port of Sidekick, there's tools for mailers, and there's tools for most common problems. Sometimes shards can even be ported from an existing Ruby gem. 
a few years ago, I created a shard that was a port of Active Support's inflector module. This module is what handles making words, plural or singular, snake case or camel case, and a variety of other string manipulations that Active Support gives us. It was surprisingly easy to complete with a large amount of code that did not need to be modified. I think about 80% of code could be directly copied, and then the rest, the other 20%, had to be updated to work with Crystal. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that Crystal code can be very easy to understand, and it can feel very familiar to write. There's likely an existing library for our specific use cases. Contributing to existing projects can be relatively straightforward. And all in all, I think Crystal is a great tool for Rubyist to look into. So let's take a look at our current problem that we're dealing with at the real real, well, one of them, which is sitemap generation. We generate links for all of our shopping pages to be indexed in search engines. This includes every sale, every product category, designer, promotion, and every product that's currently for sale. We also include some business-related links, such as about us, press pages, shipping return info, pretty much all the standard things that you would want to be indexed in search engines. So what makes that so difficult for us? Well, we generate over 18 million links, almost all of which are products currently for sale. This process takes about six hours to run on the existing Ruby code to do this. And because we are adding new products every day to our site, we have to update our sitemaps daily. And because this takes so long, we have to run it overnight. And that's the only time that it will work in our infrastructure. Additionally, the process is very memory hungry. The tool that we use for generation actually accumulates all the links in an array until the end of processing. And that's when it generates all the sitemaps and clears, every, all, clears everything out of memory. We are also loading the entire objects out of our database <laughs> instead of just the fields that we need for sitemap generation. Changing that would improve memory usage a little, but it still doesn't solve it because we're still accumulating links in an array, uh, 18 million of those links. And one last note in regarding our process is that our shopping front end for customers isn't even delivered by the Rails monolith anymore. It's delivered by one of those Elixir apps. That means that some of our Rails code isn't necessary anymore. It's only used in site generation. And if we remove sitemap generation, we can go clean out a decent amount of dead code. We also aren't adding maintenance complexity when we switch this to a new service because that complexity has already been distributed among different services. So in essence, there's no reason that Rails has to do sitemap generation. There's not really much business logic, and it makes it a perfect prototype to see what we can do separate of Rails. So the question is, is sitemap really that complex? Like, it kind of sounds like it. But the answer is no, it's really not. It's actually incredibly simple, and it's simple enough that we can fit an example on a single slide that I believe is pretty readable to everyone. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like in Ruby. Uh, starting from the beginning, uh, the gem is called the sitemap generator. That's the gem. Uh, the class that we use to generate sitemaps is the sitemap class. We call the create method on that class, and we pass it a block. This is pretty typical Ruby DSL that we're looking at so far. Inside that block, there's one main method that gets used called add and that's to add the links to the list that gets stored for later. It accepts some options, and we use options for page change frequency and last modification time. Those are things that are heavily used by search engines. Uh, we then iterate through various models. I only show two loops on here, but we have five models that we loop through. And we create a link object for each one. And then we also have some business-related links, like I mentioned earlier. When this block ends, that's when it generates all the sitemap data. So as it goes, it accumulates all those links up to over 18 million. 
And like I said, we have a little bit more that goes into this, but this is pretty simple. Like, it's you add a link, you loop through some products, you add links for each of them. That's pretty straightforward. So now that we've seen how simple code can be, now we can kind of consider whether it's feasible to actually do this in Crystal and replace our existing Ruby infrastructure for it. So the first thing that we had to consider is what do we want to achieve? Well, we want to make it fast. That's the obvious thing. If it takes six hours and we have to do this at certain times because of that, that's something that can be a problem. If we could improve that, we can improve our scheduling. We could run it multiple times a day. We could even run it immediately following product launches. We, we tend to launch product in the morning and the afternoon, and we could just run it immediately following that. We can also reduce memory usage. This would allow us to lower the requirements for our server infrastructure that does this processing, which would also help with our overall system flexibility. There are a couple intangible benefits, though, too. The biggest one is that we can improve long-term sustainability. Recurring tasks that will continue to grow over time will eventually become problematic. And as our business grows, this task will grow also. So the question becomes, do we deal with this now when it's still manageable, or do we deal with it when it becomes an emergency in the future? And lastly, if we can remove code that isn't used anywhere, that's going to help with that maintainability of our Rails app itself. Um, and that's going to be primarily the routing layer, but it also is going to include some helper logic for product links, some controllers and specs that have just kind of been left because we can't pull everything out. And it, it would be really nice for you know, our cognitive overload or our co cognitive load if we could remove those things. So now that we've established what we want to achieve, now we can consider whether Crystal would be feasible to achieve it. And the first things to examine are the scope of the problem and what tools are necessary to solve it. First, we need to be able to access the database. We have all that data that we've talked about, we need to be able to get to it. We also have some path helpers for routing. And then obviously, we have the actual sitemap creation. So then we take a look to see what tools are available in the Crystal ecosystem to help build this. The first thing is to find tooling for sitemap generation. Because if there isn't that, this project is going to become a lot larger than we were hoping for. And we wanted something straightforward that we can prototype and test quickly. Luckily for us, there is a tool called Sitemapper. <laughs> And it's fully featured as well. Secondly, while there are plenty of tools to access databases, there is one specific tool that implements the active record pattern. And it feels very familiar for how we are used to interacting with active record. This one is called Jennifer. And lastly, revisiting those path helpers. Well, there's only five of them. And since they're not used by Rails anymore, we can probably just implement them manually. So the biggest question becomes, how difficult would it be to port this over to Crystal, specifically with the sitemap generation logic? Here's a reminder of what the sitemap generation code looks like in Ruby. It's that big block with the most important method being add, adding a link to the sitemap list. Inside that block, we iterate through products, sales, designers, et cetera. Well, this is what it would look like if we did it in Crystal. The green highlights here are the diff between Ruby and Crystal. We have to change the constant because we're using a different library with a different name. And now we add a block variable that we'll call builder. And now that add method is a method on the builder object and not a global method. But that's it. All the code to iterate through models and read attributes is going to be the same in Crystal as it is in Ruby. That's because we're using that library called Jennifer, which is similar to Active Record. Now, we'll have to set that up, but we'll get there later. 
And the last thing to look at is that add method, because if that was different, then we would also have to update that. But it takes the same options as the Ruby version does, because those options are passed directly to the generated output. So just by looking at this, it seems like we have everything that we need to move forward. It looks feasible. It looks like we can do it with minimal changes to the existing code. Now we just have to build a prototype. So let's build it. Well, the first thing that we're gonna look at is the database modeling. We will be using the Crystal Shard Jennifer to accomplish this. It has a similar query API to Active Record. It includes scopes and associations. And our goal is to minimize changes to the sitemap generation code. So we will set up our data models similarly to how they have been in Rails to accomplish that. So let's take a look at how we would do that. At the very beginning, the class definition looks similar to active record models. We inherit from a base class that Jennifer provides. However, because Crystal is strongly typed and compiled, we need to provide some type information for it. So we tell it that our data has timestamps. And then we also provide designer ID, taxon ID, and then the primary key for just ID. Um, we then provide information about the associations through the belongs to designer and belongs to taxon. This is just like we do in Rails. And we also set up a single scope that we're going to use later. So now that we've set up our database models, let's take a look at how we would interact with them. Just like earlier, this is gonna look pretty familiar because it's the same as active record. For the first example, we have a class landing page. It has a scope, has designer, which is what we just had in the previous slide. And we're gonna tell it to eager load the associations for designer and taxon. In the second example, we have a spree product and we're gonna call a scope called available on that. And in the third example, we see how we can iterate through the data and access the attributes. It's just the same as we do in Ruby. We have sale, we call a scope called active on it, and then we use a find each method to gracefully iterate through large, large data sets. That find each is gonna be the same that active record has, where it's gonna load a thousand records and provide them one by one for us to work through. We're gonna access the attributes, the same that we do, sale.id and sale.permalink. So now that we've figured out how to do our data modeling, let's take a look at how we handle sitemap generation. Again, the crystal shard for this is sitemapper. It has a similar API to the Ruby gem that we have been using called sitemap generator. It has the same configuration options and it has the same functionality, which is mostly compression of the output data and also to upload to S3. It can also ping search engines to tell them that we've updated our sitemaps. And again, our, code, our goal is to minimize code changes. This time it's for the sitemap generation code. So showing this slide from earlier, it's very minimal changes that you're gonna have to see. We have to change the constant, we add the block variable, and then we call add on that block variable. But there's a little bit of support in code too, which I kind of touched on earlier, so let's take a peek at that. So I've highlighted three methods that we haven't seen the source for yet. There's fetch products. That's a method that already exists in our current sitemap generation, and it just handles um, a few different scopes for what products we want to pull up and generate links for. And then we also have product path and flash sale path. In Rails, those are just the path helpers that we get for routing. Um, in here, we can just create them manually. And this is what it's gonna look like. Since the routing isn't, or since the delivery of content isn't handled by Rails, we don't need to maintain the same flexibility that we have using the routing helpers. We can just hard code this in because if it did change, it would need to be changed everywhere anyways. And like I said, there's fetch products, which looks just like typical loading data in Rails. 
So going back to the generation code, it looks like it's just about ready to go. Like I mentioned, we have a few more classes that we iterate through and a few more static links, but otherwise it looks just like this. So after all of this, does it actually work? Well, yes, it does. There is a caveat though, but let's look at the results. The first thing that we discover is it's incredibly fast. Working with those same 18 million records, it finishes in about 15 minutes. This is a huge improvement from the six hours that we're used to. This means that this is a viable idea that we can continue to work on and fine tune. However, it does suffer from the same memory leak as the Ruby version. The Crystal library also accumulates all the links until the end of the processing block. And in fact, it's this, finding this here, that made me realize it and go find it in the Ruby gem itself. But maybe we can fix this. Like I said earlier, contributing to Crystal code can be very straightforward because it's so similar to Ruby and that's what we're familiar with. So as I'm thinking through what can we do to make this a little better, I remember sitemap files can only contain 50,000 links and you have to split them into more files when you go past that. So maybe we can write out the files as we go and then we don't need to keep all of the links in memory the entire time. So I dove into the crystal code for sitemapper and eventually I got it working to write the files and reset the links as it went through processing. I submitted a PR and after some conversation and updates with the maintainer, we merged it. And then with this functionality working, we can rerun the generator and we don't have the memory leak anymore. The memory usage is, in, is so much lower and it's stable throughout the entire processing. This is a huge win for us. In fact, we couldn't previously run site generation on our developer machines with a production size data set. And now we can do it in 15 minutes. This is with 18 million products and a few other classes that I've mentioned before. And for that generation time, that 892 is 14 minutes and 52 seconds. And again, this is coming from six hours previously in production. And this example is running on a developer machine. So we might even get a bigger boost in production. So let's have an overview of the final solution because it's actually really cool. First, what went into this? Well, it took about one day just to get a functional prototype. A functional prototype meaning we could run the generation, it would complete, and the output files matched what Rails was generating already. Then it took another day to fix the memory leak and optimize some code for Crystal. It took one PR to fix that. And all in all, it took less time working on this than I spent preparing for this talk, <laughs> which is the really exciting thing. And also in the end, the code is incredibly minimal too. There's two main files with code, and all combined, it's about 185 lines. So small that I can fit it on there, albeit in very microscopic print. There are 90 lines for this generation process, which is identical to the existing Ruby code. And there's about 95 lines for the model definitions. <clears throat> and this is for the entire solution. As long as it has database access, this can run completely independently of the rest of our infrastructure, all in 185 lines. We don't need all of the Rails infrastructure now. And I just wanna take a moment <clears throat> to recap the creative process involved here. The first thing to do is examine what the problem is and realize that it's loosely coupled to Rails, and that means it can potentially be extracted into another service. Then we have to consider how to solve it. We're already familiar with Ruby and Crystal, and we know that similar Crystal tooling exists that would allow us to test this without wasting a lot of time, like we saw earlier. And lastly, when needed, we can utilize our existing Ruby knowledge to contribute back to Crystal. And the last thing is just a general sense of fun 
chasing down problems. There's something really exciting about taking difficult problems and finding a solution for them. So the last thing is I just want to take a moment to thank everyone. Thank you to RubyConf for giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, thank you to all of you. This is my first time speaking at a conference, and I really appreciate all of you being here with me today. And thank you to The Real Real for supporting me speaking here. And I do have to say, I don't have to, but I'm going to. We are actively hiring, uh, even in the current times. So come talk to me if solving hard problems sounds exciting to you. Uh, I have some, there's plenty of resources out there for Crystal, and here's just a few of them. Um, Crystal's Lang, Crystal Lang's website is really good. Um, they have a ton of documentation, uh, lots of resources for people. There's that second link is actually an inter a interactive Crystal interpreter online that you can punch code in and run it and see what happens. Uh, there's a Crystal for Rubyists website with a variety of resources for learning about Crystal. And then there's even a page in Crystal's docs that will list popular Ruby gems and their Crystal equivalent. And so with that, are there any questions? Okay. So the first question is why is Crystal so much faster than Ruby? And the second question is why does it look so similar? Um, the first question is because it's a compiled language and it's designed to run at the speed of C. As for why it looks so similar to Ruby, um, it takes, it basically started out as, you know, it was created by people who were Ruby developers, uh, similar to how Elixir was founded by former Rails developers. And it's basically designed to be familiar to humans and easy to write, just like Ruby is, give it all those benefits while being highly performant like C. Are there any others? Yeah, so the question is, I mentioned how I made changes to the Crystal library to write out the files as, as we were working through them, and whether I went back to the Ruby library to try that. I didn't go back and try that. I basically tried to run the Ruby version on my development machine, and it was so slow with the large data sets that even if I could fix that, it was still gonna take hours to run on my machine. Um, so that would be something that would be good for that library, most likely, but it still wouldn't have solved our problems. And then if, anyone, if no one else has one, I'll go back to you. <laughs> So his question was, is there any precedent for triggering Crystal from Ruby? Um, kind of. A few years ago, there was a lot of work about writing native extensions for Ruby with Crystal. Um, I did a lot of work on it, and a couple of the Crystal, uh, Crystal developers were, were experimenting with it too. The way that the Crystal language kind of changed as it got closer to 1.0, made that more difficult, and nobody's really worked on that in the last few years. I do think it is a really cool idea because we do have you know, some you know, math intensive or data processing intensive things in Ruby that could take a huge speed up. Um, but at this current time, there's, there's nothing for that right now. But it's, it's certainly been looked at in the past. I don't have a bench, oh, so the question was if I have a production environment benchmark for the crystal builds. I don't have that, but I do have some ideas on the production data set on a developer machine for a slight comparison. And in one hour on a developer machine, I think it got through like one million records. So we're looking at 18 hours on a development machine. Um, Unfortunately, our, with a data set this big, our machines end up killing the process before it really gets <laughs> far enough to, to have a huge benchmark. Um, but so that's where I see optimism that it might, it might be even faster than 15 minutes in production. Anyone else? Am I missing anyone? 
Okay, well, again, thank you all very much. I really appreciate you all coming and attending this with me.